All right, it is 3.05 on the nose, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for everybody uh, for coming to the College of Science research talk this week. Today, we are very lucky to have Hillary Hurst with us, uh, and I'll tell you more about her in a second. Um, I am Miri Van Hoven. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Science. Um, and Michael is on his way back from the CSU Dean's meeting, uh, driving right now. So um, he let me have the honor of introducing Hillary today. Um, welcome to all our in-person participants. Welcome to our many online participants. Hillary is clearly very popular and I think you've all made a smart choice coming today. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Hillary before we get started. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at San Jose State. She's a quantum educator and theoretical physics researcher with broad interests in condensed matter theory, many body atom atomic physics, and open quantum systems. Her research primarily focuses on the theory of quantum noise and quantum measurement and feedback control for many body quantum systems. In addition to research, Dr. Hurst is passionate about making quantum physics education more accessible and preparing students to work in the growing quantum technology industry. Dr. Hurst is originally from Greeley, Colorado and received her BS in engineering physics from the Colorado School of Mines in 2012. And she went on to earn a master's in applied mathematics and theoretical physics at the University of Cambridge um, in the UK and then received her PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics from the Joint Quantum Institute at the University of Maryland. Following her doctoral work, she was a National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at NIST in Quantum Measurement Division. Dr. Hirsch joined the faculty of San Jose State University in fall 2020. Um, I'll just really quickly give you a couple of ground rules here, essentially, Anyone is welcome to ask a question anytime. Um, if we receive it, you can either ask it in the chat or you can put it in the q and If it looks like something that can wait till the end of the talk, we'll leave it there. But if it looks like something that help everybody understand what's going on right now, I'll go ahead and inter um, interrupt Hillary. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Hillary. Great, so yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about some of my work uh, in both creating new kind of course pathways in quantum physics and also some of my research. Um, so I really appreciate everyone for joining here in the room and also virtually. Um, I have worked here since fall 2020, but I have, this is my first semester on campus from start to finish. Um, so I, I'm really enjoying still meeting people uh, and getting to know the campus. Um, so this is a little bit two talks in one. I most certainly have too many slides, so we will have to uh, make a cut somewhere. Um, but I thought I would start by talking about um, really what is quantum technology and why is this an interesting field um, and some of the efforts going on here at SJSU uh, in quantum information science and engineering. Um, and I'll talk about uh, a new class that I developed called Fundamentals of Quantum Information. Um, and then in the second part, I'm going to talk about some of my research in my group. So uh, my research is, uh, as Mary mentioned, my research is focused on quantum noise and quantum control. Um, so I'll talk about a few projects on quantum control for ultra cold atoms, uh, and I will uh, explain what an ultra cold atom is when we get to that point in the talk. Um, so quantum mechanics, uh, quantum theory is not exactly a new theory. It's been around for more than 100 years now, but it dictates the properties of subatomic particles and other microscopic objects. Um, and for this talk, I just want to uh, mention some important differences from our regular understanding of the world. Um, and in physics, we say the regular understanding is our classical understanding. Um, so the three most important aspects of quantum physics, um, one is that many aspects of the microscopic world are essentially probabilistic, not deterministic. So that means some things are um, basically unknown uh, to us, even at the most fundamental level. Um, some aspects of the world are discontinuous. So they, there can be two possible values um, but nothing in between, for example. Um, so this is really where the word quantum and quantum mechanics comes from, um, because if something is discontinuous, it can only take discrete values. We often say that it is quantized. Um, finally, information in quantum systems can be stored non-locally. This means it can be stored across very large distances. 
um, through a phenomenon called quantum entanglement. Um, so quantum entanglement uh, really enables um, some of the more interesting applications of quantum information science. So quantum mechanics underpins many new technologies, but also technologies that have been around for some time now. So things like transistors, electronic components, um, atomic clocks, laser technology, superconductors, all of those things rely on quantum mechanics to function. Um, and these, uh, the, the transistor I think is approaching its 100th birthday actually. So this is not a, a new technology necessarily, but it does rely on quantum mechanics to function. Um, then we have some uh, newer technologies, uh, quantum computers, the possible quantum internet and quantum sensors um, that also rely on quantum mechanics um, in a little bit of a different way than some of these older technologies, which we'll get into. Um, quantum sensors in particular are very interesting because they enable us to sense really, really tiny changes in the uh, environment around us, like really, really small magnetic fields or um, other fields. Um, so this is a picture of IBM's quantum computer. Um, uh, this is actually a little bit of an old picture now. It's a few years old. Um, and so when I was in graduate school, which wasn't really that long ago, there, were, there was no such thing as a functional quantum computer, and now we have them. Um, so IBM has, uh, has one of the largest ones. I think last I checked, they have 128 qubits. Do you think they have more now? Um, so it's still small on the scale. So a qubit is a quantum bit. Um, it's the fundamental unit of information for quantum computing. And it's similar to a classical bit. Um, but right now we have a computer that has about 128 qubits. So you can imagine if you had a 128 bit computer, you couldn't do that many computations. It's still fairly small. Um, but they are scaling up and growing all the time. Um, I, I couldn't uh, give this talk without mentioning the Nobel Prize in Physics, which was just awarded uh, recently. Um, and this was awarded to three scientists who figured out how to generate entangled states. So these states that store information non-locally. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna be calling this quantum 2.0. So technology relying on large scale distributed entanglement. So that's the difference between some of these older technologies like lasers and um, transistors that do have quantized energy levels or quantum aspects to them, but there's not entanglement in those uh, devices. Um, with a quantum computer or a quantum internet, we are trying to um, develop something that has large scale distributed entanglement. So um, to kind of give a, a broad overview of what the field of quantum technology looks like these days, um, I would place uh, these new quantum 2.0 technologies in basically three buckets. Um, and each of these buckets are um, undergoing massive uh, growth right now and a lot of exciting advances, but there's also challenges to their implementation. Um, so to start with quantum computing, that's the one that's uh, probably the most uh, well-known. Um, quantum computers promise faster algorithms for certain types of problems, um, more energy efficient computing, which is not necessarily something that people think of initially with quantum computers, but they can be more energy efficient. Um, and things like better optimization problems um, are all in the wheelhouse of a quantum computer. Um, but the challenges of quantum computers right now are uh, their accuracy. So um, the process of error correction is very much not um, is not fully developed for quantum computers uh, in the hardware sense and, and scale. So you can have a, an accurate quantum computer, but only with a few qubits. Um, and as I mentioned before, scaling them up is a core challenge uh, right now. So the second bucket is quantum sensing. So quantum sensors um, um, promise enhanced metrology and better imaging. Uh, and even for things like uh, medical imaging applications or um, I talked to some folks last week who are doing quantum sensors for sort of geophysics. I'm trying to figure out where water is, for example, um, and they can offer a much better uh, sensitivity um, because quantum systems are so sensitive to their environment. So that's um, my area of research. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on in the talk. The challenge with quantum sensors right now is, um, in my view, is really portability. So how do we get them out of the lab? and onto something that can be used out in the world, um, like a portable magnetometer. And then um, finally, we have quantum communication. So quantum communication um, promises very secure communications and long distance distribution of quantum information. Um, but similarly to 
quantum computing, there's a challenge of scalability and also generating long-lived entanglement. So um, entanglement is um, a really amazing property, but it's also very fragile. Um, so this is where sort of the uh, industry, I think, is looking in these three buckets. Um, but my research is actually a little bit further afield um, in something called quantum simulation. So um, I'm a little bit more removed from the applications here. And quantum simulation is really about um, engineering new quantum systems to help us understand things that we know act quantumly uh, out in the real world. Um, so this is more of a basic research uh, bubble, which is why I put it in green. But what we hope to do with quantum simulation is to lead to a better understanding of our natural world, something that all physicists and scientists uh, strive for. Do you have a hand up? Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, it, it means uh, what's the effect of the errors in your system, right? So you can have, uh, in a classical computer, you could have an error called a bit flip, but they're extremely rare, um, which could uh, mess up your uh, computation. Um, and you can have similar errors in a quantum computer. Yeah. Um, so back to quantum simulation, uh, it's more of a, a research focused uh, field. Um, but we hope that it can lead into insights into mechanisms behind things that are still fundamentally mysterious to us, like high temperature superconductivity, which I know Isan works on. Um, and myself, I work on the nature of quantum measurement. Um, so um, thinking about the fact that uh, nature itself is quantum mechanical, um, how can we use well-controlled quantum systems to better understand um, existing quantum mechanical systems? So over the last really just couple of years, there has emerged this term called quantum engineering. Um, and quantum engineering is sort of a, it's an emerging discipline, I would say, that covers not only the discovery and sort of exploration of quantum phenomena, but really the engineering and manipulation side. So this gets more at um, how do we build useful technologies using what we know about quantum systems, right? So this is just a nice uh, graphic that I found from the University of Bristol that encompasses a lot of the different aspects of quantum science. Um, so physics is here, um, but certainly there's a lot of other fields involved. So chemistry, engineering, mathematics, um, computer science is in there. Um, so things like studying algorithms, it's a very computer science approach to uh, quantum uh, physics. Um, if you're doing engineering, maybe you're uh, engineering new devices or something like that. Um, so as a physicist, um, I am here to say that we need more than just physicists to do this work. Um, and the, whether, uh, whether this field eventually continues to be called quantum engineering, whether it's called quantum information science, whether it's something else, it's clear that it's becoming more and more interdisciplinary and we need more expertise uh, to help us solve some of these um, challenging problems. So there's a new um, landscape for what we call quantum education. Um, as quantum engineering gains traction, students from outside of physics, uh, people in engineering, computer science, mathematics, are taking greater interest in this field in quantum information. Um, and typically educational offerings are just not meeting them where they're at. So um, quantum physics is basically, typically taught as an upper level elective or a core course, depending on where you are, for physics majors. So it's pretty unusual for a non-physics major to take that class. If you're a chemist, you might take physical chemistry. Um, you might take some transport uh, if you're an engineer, um, but you may not learn some of the theory behind it. Um, and so kind of a course that encompasses quantum information science is lacking in a lot of places. And then um, reaching a diverse student population remains a huge challenge, right? So the fields that sort of make up quantum engineering right now, electrical engineering, physics, computer science, they're not very diverse. Um, and so we're hoping to bring more folks into the field, but we can't look within the subfields to find that diversity, right? So we wanna bring more people in. Um, there has been a series of workshops actually funded by the National Science Foundation to uh, try and attack this problem of uh, basically holes in our quantum education. So there was one at Colorado School of Mines um, that I was involved in organizing. Um, there was a nice one at the University of Illinois that was actually, this workshop was about what kind of things do we uh, impart to high school teachers to help people understand what quantum mechanics is at the high school level. 
Um, and then there was a really nice effort at CSU San Marcos that I participated in last year about undergraduate specific quantum training, um, both in physics and engineering. Um, and so a lot of folks from within the CSU and all around the country are looking at this problem and trying to figure out um, what are the course offerings that we need? What are the best ways to approach this um, uh, new field and how to educate more people in it? Um, one of the products from the workshop that I was involved in was this paper on uh, quantum engineering at the undergraduate level. Um, so it's a big long list of folks involved in this paper. Um, but in this uh, paper, we outlined some recommendations for how to build um, a quantum engineering program that's both inclusive of um, folks of different backgrounds, but also folks of different um, coming from different departments. Um, and what are the sort of necessary things in a first course of quantum uh, for, say, quantum 101, like for a freshman, um, or for a more advanced course in quantum. So we lay out some different recommendations. Um, and you'll notice that this paper was published in IEEE Transactions on Education, right? So this is, um, this is a, an engineering journal, um, and engineers are seeing that there's a real opportunity here um, to help their students learn um, this material and be able to participate in the, the quantum workforce. Um, so the team at SJSU that's working on these um, this curricular uh, development is myself, um, Dr. Hugh Young Wong in electrical engineering and Dr. Asan Kotami in physics. Um, so we've got two physicists and one electrical engineer right now, um, but we'd be happy to talk to other folks um, and grow the, the collaboration here on campus. So if there's uh, folks from computer science, mathematics, or even another field, maybe quantum biology could be part of it. Um, we'd love to hear from you and um, and grow uh, sort of our team on, on campus. So right now we're working on some course development um, that I'll talk about in a minute, and that's funded by uh, an award. So um, I developed a new course uh, last year um, that has been uh, put through the, the system and will be a permanent offering called Fundamentals of Quantum Information. Um, and this is an introduction to quantum mechanics from a quantum information science perspective. So it assumes very few prerequisites. Um, uh, it does assume some linear algebra knowledge, um, but the focus is on discrete quantum systems. So for experts, um, we only stick with one and two quantum states, and but we really emphasize entanglement. So I'm right now I'm teaching more traditional quantum mechanics class and we only had time for two lectures on entanglement. Um, but in this course, we focus on entanglement a lot more. Um, I incorporate active learning via some in class uh, exercises that I make heavy use of visualization. And we don't introduce wave functions or continuous variable systems. Um, so this is, uh, it's, a, it's a choice that has to be made basically on what we wanna study. And we found that talking with folks in industry and in quantum computing specifically, um, understanding wave functions is maybe not a priority actually. Um, so, and then finally, we wanna focus on applications and algorithms rather than the theory. Um, so, there's less emphasis on so sort of formal mathematical postulates, um, which is what you would have in a more traditional quantum mechanics class. Um, so I've taught it once and I'll be teaching it again next fall um, and just a few lessons learned. Um, so I found that the physicists uh, really want to know about quantum hardware um, they, and then the engineering students similarly. So they want to know what actually makes a qubit and how do you build it. Um, and so I would uh, I'm going to incorporate more of that in the future. Um, more discussion of decoherence mechanisms. Um, so decoherence is the way that quantum systems essentially lose their quantumness, um, the way that entanglement disappears. Um, and it's something that's, uh, that's difficult to teach at the undergraduate level, but I think not impossible. And I would like to implement more about decoherence. And then of course, every student population is different. So this class was um, primarily physics majors. We had one computer engineering uh, major, um, but we'd like the, this class to appeal more broadly. Um, okay, uh, and then this is all leading up to a new master's program in quantum technology that's currently going through the approval process. So this is not yet approved, um, not promising any new program, but we're um, working together um, to create this program that's going to be interdisciplinary and co-housed in both physics and electrical engineering. So it's going to be housed within two different colleges, and it offers four core classes, the course that I just mentioned, and then three other ones. Um, and this is supported by the NSF uh, Research Traineeship Program, which is a program for graduate education. So in this program, we also have a partnership with Colorado School of Mines uh, to develop and share some curricular materials. 
So Mines has a master's in quantum engineering already. It was the first one in the country. Um, so they're helping us develop some of our material. And then um, one of our local partners in this is also Lawrence Livermore National Lab. So um, Livermore uh, has a super connecting quantum devices group that offers a lot of uh, great research uh, experiences for students. Um, and there are some uh, master's fellowships available. Um, and I put the website there for more information. So as an example of one of the activities that has already come out of this collaboration, we hosted a workshop last year on real world, we called it real world quantum computing at Livermore. So this was a collaboration with the uh, Livermore QDIT testbed. So it's a testbed for folks who wanna run new quantum algorithms on their hardware. Um, and we, so we hosted a two day uh, quantum computing workshop that was really interactive. So um, the students learn the fundamentals of superconducting qubits. So superconducting qubits are one particular type of hardware that's um, really gaining ground right now. That's what the IBM computer is built out of. Um, and so the students were actually able to log in and access the superconducting qubit um, and characterize it. So they were able to run code to show what the frequency of the qubit was and things like that. Um, so getting this access to real quantum hardware is, um, is unusual. And so this partnership with Livermore has really enabled us to provide some amazing experiences for the students. So we do plan to run this workshop again in the summer. We ran it in June. Um, so I'll be sure to send out an announcement to class if anybody is interested. Um, so students from any field would be interested. Um, the other thing, just to put in a plug for Livermore, they have a lot of summer internship opportunities available and they're pretty close by. Um, so if anybody is interested in other opportunities there, um, please just let me know or you can look them up. Okay, so um, that was part one that's really about quantum education. Maybe we could stop if there's any other questions that might be uh, good for this time. Okay. Any questions? Yes, we do the block sphere. Um, so the question was if we introduce the block sphere. Um, yeah, I heavily do the block sphere um, as a, a visual representation for a single qubit state. <laughs> okay, and then once you introduce the block sphere and then you want to describe an angle, you use the block sphere to be able to expand what you can control. That's a really, that's a good question. So I have found that the block sphere, the utility of the block sphere for me stops at one qubit. So you need two qubits at least to have entanglement. So you need two particles, two quantum particles to have entanglement. Um, and there are some ways that you can write the block sphere of block sphere type representation for two particles, but I find that it falls apart a little bit. Um, so to teach entanglement, um, there's a couple of different ways. Um, I'm actually, teaching it next week in my other class. Um, and I use a simulation that looks at different ways we can measure systems to distinguish whether they're entangled or not. So it's a little bit more abstract, um, but I think that um, unfortunately the block sphere is great for single qubits and single qubit gates, but more qubits than that, it gets to be um, a less useful visual aid. So then if you want to visualize entanglement, um, how would you do that? Uh, yeah, so there's yeah, a- yeah, um, I think it's it's one of those things that's that's pretty hard to visualize, right? Um, but once we learn the notation, then we can look at um, different experiments that show correlated measurements. So basically, if you have entanglement in your system, um, then you can see that by looking at correlations between measurements done by two separate parties, like spaced very far apart. Um, and so I have a nice uh, simulation. It's not something that I wrote, uh, but uh, it's through the quantum mechanics visualization project. Um, that sort of shows how that would work. Um, so it's still um, spin one half systems, it's still like a qubit, um, but it sort of shows the two observers measuring uh, different quantities for their systems and then how the correlations emerge. So that's the way that I've, I've taught it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about established career trajectories with a degree like the MS Quantum Technology. Um, so most folks, most folks with this skill set would go to work in like an engineering type role. Um, I think so. There there are established career paths into the small quantum computing industry, but it is small at this moment. Um, but the other thing I would say about this degree is that. 
there are only a handful of these degrees in the country right now. So right now, a lot of folks with PhDs in physics are being hired into those roles, but I am not convinced that you need a PhD to do those jobs. Um, so you might go in as an engineer or someone doing simulations, um, so a, a theorist, um, looking at very specific problems. So if we want to generate a certain type of pulse to generate um, a particular type of single cubic gate, that might be a problem that you could look at. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, Mary had a... How do you introduce decoherence at the undergraduate yeah. level? Yeah, that is a really great question. I would say that's one of my biggest challenges. Um, right now, the way that I've done it is I talk about um, these so-called Schrodinger cat experiments, um, which actually show kind of how decoherence emerges. Um, and without getting too far off track, essentially, um, you can do these experiments where you send an atom into a cavity and the number of photons in the cavity dictates whether it acts quantum or classical. So as it gets more and more classical, you see the quantum effects going away. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way is to introduce all of the machinery of density matrices, which so far I haven't done, but I am thinking about doing because um, that is a really, uh, so a density matrix is just another way of describing a quantum system. And there's a really clear signature of decoherence in a density matrix is when the off diagonal elements go to zero. So that's a much more mathematical uh, formulation of decoherence, but um, conceptually it's a, it's a very just difficult thing to wrap your head around. So um, I am thinking about doing the density matrix formalism, but right now I, I stick with the Schrodinger cat experiments. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think there's kind of a, when I thought about what kind of force to develop, there was really, it was a trade off. It was like, do I want to like go the full GE route and do a quantum 101, which would be really fun, but very different? Or do I want to do something a little bit more upper level quantum information science? Um, and I decided to go the second route, but I agree with infinite time and resources. I would love to do that. Um, I actually want to call out a specific uh, colleague within the CSU. So Gina Pasante at CSU Fullerton is developing a class like that um, and has some fantastic, uh, she has some fantastic exercises on things like that. So folks are also thinking about going that route, um, which we discussed in that paper that I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so follow up question or do you want to save it for the end? Uh, we can do one more follow up and then I'll talk about my research for 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, so follow up. Um, I've been used uh, on something to talk about could you use open quantum systems? Yeah, yeah, I think that you can. Um, I think that, uh, um, there are systems that are open quantum systems that are coupled to their environment that don't decohere. So you'd have to figure out uh, a sort of specific uh, setup in order to describe it. Um, but essentially, like the way that I describe decoherence just sort of in passing is like it, the environment leaches quantum information out of your system until all the quantum information is gone. Um, so there is a sense that your system kind of has to be open to undergo de decoherence, but I haven't figured out a really great way of um, describing it because closed quantum systems are hard enough. And then when you put the openness into it, it's like opens a whole box of worms for the students. So. Yeah, I would love to discuss that more which, with whoever asked that question. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move on to some of the research that I've been working on. Um, so just a quick overview of some of my interests, uh, which are broad. Um, so I have done some work on weak measurement and feedback for ultra cold atoms. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, another uh, side of my research is uh, using non-Hermitian physics to study um, 
to study phenomena in magnetic systems. And so I won't talk about that today, but I worked with a great SJSC student on that project. And then a new, uh, newer project with Lauren Livermore Lab is actually quantifying quantum noise in solid state devices. Um, so this is just a schematic of a coupled qubit system um, and how we might start to think about quantifying uh, a situation where they share a noise reservoir. Um, but today I'm gonna be talking about the weak measurement and feedback for ultra cold atoms. Um, and the idea, if, if you have in mind a schematic, say we have a quantum system that's the blue ball right here and we wanna learn something about it. Um, and then we wanna um, control it in some way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna couple it to um, a meter, we call a quantum meter. Um, and then we're gonna get a measurement signal out and I'll discuss that briefly. Um, and then based on that measurement signal, we might apply some feedback uh, to the system to drive it into a particular state. Um, I wanna mention that there is actually an experimental platform for doing this research um, and it's called ultra cold atomic systems. Um, ultra cold atoms are extremely, extremely cold. So I put up this slide because I just like to illustrate. So um, over here we have the sun, then us, then deep space. Ultra cold atoms are all the way down here. Um, so we cool them down uh, to nano Kelvin uh, degrees. I do not cool them down, my collaborators with experiments do. Um, and we create something called a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, and the Bose-Einstein condensate is a very special type of quantum system where all of the particles enter the same quantum state, um, but it's uh, what we call mesoscopic. So it's not actually subatomic. It can have hundreds of thousands of particles. So it's a way of scaling up quantum mechanics to a larger system. So this shows um, the creation of a signature Bose-Einstein condensation. This is a velocity map. So here, all of the particles um, are condensing, doing condensation into a very low velocity um, as you cross the critical temperature. So this was actually first seen in 1995, um, but it's a great tool for understanding and doing quantum simulation. Um, so I'm actually gonna skip through this slide about quantum simulation um, because we're running a little slow in time. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is measuring quantum objects. So I just wanna remind us um, how we think about uh, measuring objects and plotting their trajectory. So if I imagine a ball oscillating in a potential, we would uh, we might plot its position and its momentum at different points of its um, trajectory. So as it's oscillating in uh, phase space, this is called phase space where we plot momentum and position, um, that would also be moving. So at different points in the trajectory, we can plot uh, where the ball is, its position and its momentum. So here, for example, the lowest one, it's moving very fast to the left, um, but it's in the middle of the trap. So its position is zero. Okay, um, so we do the same thing with quantum objects, but uh, we have the added, um, the added feature of quantum measurement. So um, quantum measurement, uh, quantum systems are bounded by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which basically says we can't know two quantities with absolute certainty at the same time. So rather than a classical ball, I now have uh, a fuzzy, uh, uh, quantum ball. And the width of this ball just indicates our uh, level of uncertainty in a particular quadrature, right? So the position versus the momentum. So the way that we all learn measurement uh, when we first take quantum mechanics is actually type of measurement called projective measurement. So before we measure the position of the ball is not known, we measure it with our detector. And then afterwards, the position is known extremely precisely. But because of Heisenberg uncertainty, the momentum is totally unknown, right? It gets stretched. So this is called a measurement back action and the back action is extremely strong. Um, this is one of the weird features of quantum mechanics that I won't get into too much, but the idea that measurement disturbs the system, right? So this is a projective measurement. We can do a different type of measurement called a weak measurement where we put this extra um, object in between the system and the meter. So this is still our classical meter, this black box, but now we put an extra quantum meter between. So the quantum meter and the quantum system are gonna interact for some time and become entangled. And then we're gonna measure the meter. What happens when we do that is we get the position, um, but the position becomes actually a more random uh, variable that we don't know precisely. So um, we can think of this uh, curly phi here as the measurement strength and think of it as something much less than one. So, um, and it comes with a random, random noise. So essentially, because we've now put this extra uh, object in between, we don't know the position as well. So after measurement, um, if it's a weak measurement, 
the position is known slightly better. We've deformed the ball a little bit, um, but it's not uh, it's not known to the same precision that we uh, knew prior, right? So weak measurement is a way of getting partial information out of a quantum system without fully collapsing it. Um, the trade-off is that our information is noisy. So as I mentioned before, the platform where we do this work is uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. This is an image of a BEC from my collaborator's lab at NIST. And the nice thing about the condensate is you can describe it with a single wave function. And it's uh, the dynamics of this thing obey uh, an equation called the gross Podolsky equation, or also known as the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's not too important for these purposes, but the main thing is that we can define what's called a Hamiltonian, which is a function that um, basically governs the dynamics of the system. So we can do weak measurements for Bose-Einstein condensates, and the type of measurement is called phase contrast imaging. So the way the measurement works is we send light through the atom cloud, and then the light is affected based on the density of atoms. So there's a what we call a phase shift on the light that's proportional to the density. So the more atoms you have in a certain place, the more the phase shift is. We do some detection called homodyne detection, and then we get a noisy signal out. So the fluctuations here are because it's a weak measurement. So we have some baseline noise for the measurement. Um, and this is uh, just a simulation, but this type of um, imaging has actually been used in, uh, for quite some time. So the advantage of using a BEC to try and understand weak measurement for macroscopic system is you can get a lot of information out of a weak measurement. But as you're doing the measurements, you're also affecting the system. So remember what I said before, the weak measurement, it will squish the ball a little bit. Um, and this is a manifestation of that. We're creating essentially sound waves in the, in the atoms, um, which is what happens when you have measurement back action. So um, I've done a bunch of theory deriving kind of how this works for the BEC. Um, for this audience, this, this is not uh, so important, but essentially we can cook it down to a system of equations that govern the dynamics of the BEC, but it's a stochastic equation. So every time we measure, we get some random noise imparted to the system. Okay, so this is kind of the paradigm uh, that we're working in. And then I do simulations on specifically um, spinner systems. So a spinner condensate, it's very similar, but it has multiple internal states. So you think of it kind of like a magnet. You can have um, an up magnet or a down magnet, and then the atoms will either sort themselves and put all up on one side and all down on the other side, or depending on the interaction strengths, they will not sort themselves um, and you won't have phase separation between the atoms. So um, where the atoms are separated is called the domain wall. How much time should we plan for? 10 minutes? Okay, no, we can do that. I, I don't need to rush through everything. Um, so essentially our first foray into understanding weak measurement was to do it for these domain walls. And the reason is because they're viewable with our current cameras. So these things are um, a few microns wide, so you can actually see them in images very easily. And we can imagine doing a weak measurement of basically which type of atom we have. So it's still phase contrast imaging, but we have a phase shift in one direction if we've got up spin atoms and a phase shift in the other direction if we've got down spin atoms. So using this weak measurement, we can actually see pretty well where the domain wall is. And in this paper, we looked at different types of observables to figure out where the domain wall is. So through this, we can build up a picture of domain wall dynamics. So you can imagine this is one shot and then this is the position over time of a single experiment with many shots. So the color is indicating the spin polarization. So this would be the same domain wall over time. And we can extract the position um, and look at the position of the domain wall for many different experiments. So this is called a trajectory. So one experiment is a trajectory. This, uh, the plot on the far right is showing many, many trajectories. Um, and what we found and this work is that these, these objects can actually undergo diffusion, something that looks like Brownian motion, but it's only due to the quantum measurement. So it's a nice way of being able to um, characterize the quantum measurement um, back action on a system that actually has kind of a macroscopic object in it. 
All right, so I'm going to skip this slide. Um, so the next step that we wanted to do is actually to add feedback to the system to drive the system from the uh, system with a domain wall to one without a domain wall. Um, and why is this interesting? You might say, well, we're arguing that um, by doing this measurement, this is actually kind of a type of quantum state engineering. So it's very hard to engineer quantum states in real time because they undergo decoherence. They um, are very sensitive to their environments. But by doing weak measurement and then applying um, some feedback signals, we might be able to do it with a Bose-Einstein quantum state. So um, in this, uh, this slide, I'm just going to show a few different examples of how we can drive the system to a different steady state based on the applied feedback. So I haven't introduced these U's and G's. This is the strength of the feedback is on the vertical and the strength of the internal uh, interactions of the system is on the horizontal. So the first one we can imagine is starting with a system where we don't have phase separation. Then we turn on the feedback at 200 milliseconds and we drive the system into a phase separated state. So we create these domains and then we turn the feedback off at 600. Um, and you'll notice that the system doesn't go back to a nice spin unpolarized system. Um, it's got a lot of uh, excitations there. And that's because the measurement also heats up the system. Um, if we start with a domain wall and we apply the same type of feedback that would drive the system into this state with the domains, it just stays the same because we're already uh, in that native state. So the question is, can we fight the internal dynamics of the system or can we work with them? So on the flip side, um, if we have no domain and we apply feedback that would also, um, that would drive us toward a system with no domain, all we end up doing is heating up the system. And then the last one, which is my favorite, is uh, we can take a system with a domain wall um, and we can actually destroy the domain wall um, by using the feedback. So this type of feedback, real-time feedback in a macroscopic quantum system is something that um, has not been seen really experimentally uh, yet, but folks are moving in that direction. Um, and so we're arguing that this is one way to engineer, uh, engineer the state of a quantum system. So um, we can extract the steady state phases of the, the system and put it on a kind of phase diagram. I'll, I'll just briefly go through this. Um, so the red area is an ordered phase with single spin domains. And then the blue area is this sort of disordered phase where the spin orientation is really disordered. And basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to argue that the feedback can act the same way as an internal interaction in a closed system would. So we're comparing the system with feedback to what happens um, if the system is not experiencing feedback. And what we showed is that the feedback can really act as an effective interaction. So we can tune the type of interactions in the system um, with the feedback um, by, by tuning the feedback. Okay, so I'm going to skip a few slides. Um, it's not exactly an electric field. It's more like um, an optical potential. So you have a bunch of optical lasers that basically trap the atoms in like a little well. And then we can apply additional potential on top of that that will um, essentially make it so these, uh, these uh, atoms phase separate. This is done on the so you've got your BTC at the on your Oh, I see. So um, there is no substrate with BECs. So they're trapped in what's called a magneto optical trap. So it's like a long, thin gas. Um, but otherwise, what you said is correct. So we're shining the light um, at the at the atoms, and that's going to drive it into the system. So there's there's not a substrate. We're just completely um, optically trapping everything. So is one Uh yeah, you could think of it that way. So it's a node in the spin, uh the spin density. Let me actually I will put this slide up. Um if it's ideal, it's symmetric, but yeah, it's it's typically not fully symmetric. So um I, I will put this slide up uh, since we had such good questions about it. So this is just um doing some more analysis to try to look at the properties of the steady state phases. So the single domain, you can see the red line, it's really nicely phase separated across the length of the, 
uh, system, whereas the blue line is that disordered phase that happens. And so these um, really opaque lines, that's a single shot, whereas the thick lines are average over some time. So you see with the blue, we have really strong fluctuations of the spin going all over the place. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move and skip a few slides. Um, so we went back and started looking at um, how can we fix this problem of actually heating the system because the measurement heats the system as you go. Um, and we've implemented some new um, signal filtering methods to make the feedback um, a little bit less noisy um, to create uh, a better cooling system and also to um, create kind of new phases out of our condensate. So this is just a, an example of, so this is the change in energy over time for the system. And so the fact that it goes up indicates heating. Um, this, this line here is, the top line is um, what we had developed for the original data that I was just showing you. And then we have a preprint out now that is looking at different protocols to try and drive the system to a steady state and not in terms of the spin, but in terms of like the effective temperature, how much it heats up. So our initial protocol wasn't very good at it, but um, these new protocols seem to be working pretty well. Um, and a lot of it comes down to kind of like smart signal filtering um, and filtering the signal in a way that sort of agrees with what you want the system to do. So, um, one of the things we found in the course of doing this is that feedback cooling can generate some pretty weird looking states, um, states that have persistent current. Um, so where you have a superfluid current actually uh, running in the system, um, but I won't go into that too much. Um, so there's some next steps. So both of those, one of those is published, one of them's up on, on archive, but the next step uh, is kind of to move beyond the Bose-Einstein condensate, because the Bose-Einstein condensate, in some ways, it's the simplest quantum system. It's described by a single wave function. And what we're hoping to do is to move towards more strongly correlated systems um, to look at what, what's going on there. So this is a simulation by a really talented undergrad that I'm working with right now that's basically showing as you measure the system, so this is a lattice system of, of electrons, um, the probability of measuring a particular electron on a particular site is growing or shrinking. So um, let me go back here. So we start with equal probability of measuring the, the particles anywhere. And then as we weekly measure the system, we start to collapse it into a state where we have definite probability on either side. Um, so I don't have too much time to talk about this work right now, um, but it's been really fun working on that. Um, and I'm gonna keep keep working on that direction uh, with some of my students here. So to wrap up a, a brief foray into my research, um, this is uh, the beginnings of a pathway to quantum control, but quantum control for many body systems. So um, the thing that I wanna distinguish here is that quantum control for single particle systems has been around for some time, um, but it's really hard to gener generalize to condensed matter systems where you have a lot more internal stuff going on. Um, and so this is some of the work that uh, we've published in that toward that route. Um, and I'm looking forward to developing it more. Um, so this talk covered a lot of ground. So I just wanna thank a lot of folks who work with me, especially Hugh Young and Asan on the quantum education stuff. Um, and then in research, I have some collaborators here and then also um, folks still out at NIST. Um, and then of course, thanks to the students who do a lot of the work. The students in blue are the folks that I've worked at here at San Jose State. Okay. So uh, that's it. Thanks. I saw the chat, but I can't uh, click on it. Can we use feedback to do work? Uh, sure. Yeah. So you can imagine like. The way I would think about it is if you are trying to do feedback to uh, even just classically like drive uh, water up a hill or something, you can apply the feedback to do that based on like how high up the water is. Um, and you, you're doing work on the system by putting in a signal. So yeah, I think you could do it. Um, I haven't thought about the thermodynamics of it though. I think that'd be pretty interesting. Oh, please send that list to me. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's that's awesome. Yeah. So the thing is, like, 
there was not a position called quantum engineering even a few years ago. And so it's starting to become a thing. And I think every uh, company has a different definition of what that is. Um, but what we're trying to argue is that um, it should be a master's level position and we just need to give folks the skills they need to, to succeed um, in working on those systems. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the question was um, about the feedback and whether it's an added magnetic field. So um, it's a, it's an optical field, technically speaking, because these are neutral atoms. Um, but the protocol, so it's actually very similar to the way that you would generate a disordered magnetic field because you're or a disordered optical field. So you use an optical speckle uh, potential, and then you can apply the light and sort of like you can imagine the light is uh, brighter in some places and dimmer in others. It's just that we Put that pattern together so that it's specifically trying to suppress the density uh density excitations to cool the system so yeah i had to skip some of the cooling slides sorry did that answer your question yeah. so when you look at a piece of data like this how could the domain wallet has been destroyed by your, your optical hole now it looks like you still retain information you know it's not as if it's going complete you know, it's, it's not annoying. Mm, mm -hmm. So, in this result of the spheres talking to one another and being entangled, because, like, between like 200 milliseconds and 800 milliseconds, it looks like they're talking to each other. When after 800 milliseconds, it looks like some um, some coherence or some assembly is occurring. Mm -hmm. It's not the same domain that you started with. But they start to self segregate into your spins and you highlight that in blue and in yellow, but they're still there. So, yeah, it's 200, 800 milliseconds that you're kind of sloshing back and forth the spins, but they're still communicating in that way. And then you have to find the layers of data to unpack the systems being exact. Yeah, that's a really good point and sharp eye too to notice that um, because yeah, so essentially the feedback in this situation is basically scrambling the internal dynamics of the system. So the system has its own like rules that it would follow, which is the lowest energy state, the ground state is this one with a single domain. But um, after you turn the feedback off, it does start to go back to a situation where you have these, these stripes like you noticed. And this is a manifestation of um, probably um like uh it's not the ground state but it's uh, a low energy minimum um state so the system the system has interactions and that's what's causing it the system retains its interactions it's just that here we're overpowering them and here uh the internal sort of native dynamics are starting to come back out um so yeah they are still talking to each other so let's say we're just talking about of the system, like at one second we're at like one nano Kelvin, and then we put in the new optical holes in between 200 and 800 milliseconds, we're at like 30 nano Kelvin, and then it needs to cool down again. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a, um, maybe, I think that that's a good way to think about it, connecting these things to a temperature is so it's trickier than one might think because these are actually zero temperature simulations. So we what that means is that we assume there's no like initial temperature, no initial excitation. Um, this is this is uh, simulations. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have uh, I should have um, emphasized that I'm a theoretical physicist. So I hope this will uh, be done in the lab. But right now it's uh, it's a simulation. So yeah, I'm looking for a collaborator that has a spinner BEC. So the, the spinner condensates do exist. But um, this type of phase contrast imaging experiment hasn't been done yet. Um, so this is a it's a stochastic simulation of the um, equations of motion for the field that describes the system. I was just wondering, uh, I think uh, it's plausible, yeah, so. Well, actually, no, I, I don't think it's fake. And the reason is because when you turn off the, ultimately by itself with no feedback, this is a system that wants to phase separate, that the interactions are set up so that it wants to phase separate. 
So I think it's a real effect, but the, the question of how many domains are there and what's their size, that could definitely be a finite size effect. Yeah. What is the quantum meter in the lab? Oh, that's a great question. So for this particular setup, the meter is kind of like whatever you're doing, uh, whatever's interacting with the system. So like for this particular type of imaging that I uh, mentioned, the meter is the light that's shining through the atom cloud, but every setup is different. Um, and so part of my research is kind of coming up with these weak measurement models for different types of imaging systems. And Hillary, you're getting lots of great talks in the chat. <laughs> She's getting a lot of great talks in person too. <laughs> Thanks all.